your reputation, it takes a long time to create and build and can be destroyed in an instant. Appreciative inquiry. One of the things I've learned from that, you can go a lot further with any relationship if you approach that person with a real sense of respect and appreciation for whatever it is they're doing. I was very uh, iconic and famous and, and got all kind of awards. Didn't really build the business. Unfortunately, when the January the 6th riots were going on, part of the news on social media was Kendall Jenner is heading to DC now with a case of Pepsi. And I think that's the danger that some brands face today. They make some stupid brand move and then all of a sudden they go from hero to zero. Kip Knight is in the top echelon of marketing leaders in the world. Kip's phenomenal career spans decades in senior management and C-suite roles for Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, KFC, eBay, and H&R Block. He's even been a consultant to the White House. Today, he's an operating partner with TomVest, a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. In 2019, he co-wrote the book Crafting Persuasion with Bob Pearson, another guest of our show. In this book, they outline the secret sauce of high-impact marketing and outreach campaigns. Kip has launched and led some of the world's most well-known brands. Come and get an insider's look at company brands and the perceptions they create as we dive into how marketing really works. Hello and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Kip Knight. Kip, thank you so much for taking time to spend with me today. Thanks, Mark. I'm um, looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. You are a mathematical impossibility. You To, to look at your resume, it's just, it's ridiculous. It, it's one thing to have all of these incredible brands just one time, like something to aspire to, but you have led some of the most incredible and most iconic brands uh, in the world. So I, I'm very honored to, to have you on. So I want to jump in here and I, I want to jump right into one of your, one of your big achievements. And I want to talk about the Chihuahua. So tell me about the Chihuahua campaign that you led for Taco Bell. I guess it's going to be the big reveal right up front. I inherited the Chihuahua campaign at Taco Bell. And, and for those folks who haven't seen it, I'm sure it's still on YouTube, Drop the Chalupa and, and all the other fun stuff. But Mark, that campaign, unfortunately, while it was very uh, iconic and famous and, and got all kind of awards, didn't really build the business. And it was guilty of what I'll call video vampire. In other words, hmm. people would watch that commercial, talk about it. At the time, social media was just getting started, so it didn't really light up the airwaves yet. But we had plush dolls. I think at one point we were selling more plush dolls than tacos, which is not good <laughs> if you're a restaurant company. Mark, true confession time. I, I'm the one who ultimately had to kill the dog. Not wow. literally, but we had to recognize that we'd probably gotten as much uh, publicity as we needed off the dog. And we went back to talking about food. So that's a bit of a lesson for marketers. They used to have a, a joke with the ad agencies. You can get somebody's attention easily. Just put a gorilla in a jock strap, dancing on stage. But at the end of the day, if that doesn't have any uh, meaningful benefit to your target audience, you're just wasting your time. Wow. Well, that's incredible insight. And, and this is, and that's one of the things I really wanted to talk about here was to talk about how marketing really works. So I'm really grateful for that insight. So I want to take a step back for a moment and talk about brands. What is a brand and what makes a good brand? Okay, so let's pretend that unfortunately the human race gets wiped out and a millennial goes by and you have creatures from another planet come down and they're holding up what we would call a Pepsi can. And they would look at it and, and they would find it to be an interesting archeological artifact, but they wouldn't know anything at all about what the brand Pepsi stood for. And the way I think about a brand is it's the collective human consciousness of the good, the bad, and the ugly of whatever you associate with that particular product called a brand. And one way of also thinking about a brand is if you look at a balance sheet on a company and you try to figure out what the real worth of a company is, uh, there's something called goodwill. And the biggest part of a balance sheet for most companies today is the goodwill part of the uh, balance sheet. It, it's not in the physical assets, the factories or the you know, machines or any of that. It's how much does a particular target audience love, appreciate, and consume that particular brand. And 
good friend of mine who actually came after me at Taco Bell, Greg Creed, who went on to be the CEO at Yum. He had the best definition of what a CMO does and I think what marketing's challenge is today. And that is a CMO has got to build brands, build sales overnight and build a brand over time. And so you see this eternal struggle, and, and, and this has been going on ever since I started marketing, of where are the numbers, where are the sales, we've got a quarterly earnings you know, call coming up, we better have a good story, to go. And then on the other hand, you've got this thing called brand equity, which takes an investment, it takes patience, it takes the long view. And those two forces are eternally in conflict. And the smart folks are the ones who can figure out the right balance between the short-term performance and the long-term brand equity building that a marketer's got to engage in. So part of the job of a CMO, it's, it's not just creative. I mean, there's a pretty heavy business emphasis on, on marketing from the CMO perspective. Absolutely. In fact, I would say the most important role of the CMO is the strategic role. You're hiring the agency to provide the creative aspect of it. It doesn't hurt if the CMO has got a, a creative side to him or her, and, and they can have a good sense of what good creative looks like. But even if they don't have that, as long as they are a really strong strategic thinker, they should be just fine. So what brands are really doing well right now in your mind? I'm biased toward Apple. I, I've been a Mac user my entire uh, career. I'm an Apple shareholder. I, you know, believe in the brand that strongly. And they just go from success to success because Steve Jobs had another really good definition of a brand. Brand equals trust. And if you think about it, among the brands you really love, if I ask you the question, how much do you trust that brand? You'd probably say absolutely or a lot. And I could probably also say, well, are there any brands that you used to love and you don't love anymore? More than likely somewhere along the way, they broke that trust. And it's like, your reputation, it takes a long time to create and build and can be destroyed in an instant. And I think that's the danger that some brands face today. They, they get the wrong spokesperson or they, they make some stupid brand move and then all of a sudden they go from hero to zero. That, that's why it's just so important that the CMO is the steward of not only the short-term results, but also the guardian of that brand equity because at the end of the day, that will be their legacy. It won't be if, if they met you know, the last quarter results, it'll be whether or not they, they added to the long-term equity of that brand. Yeah. Are there any brands that should be concerned right now? Oh, there are a lot of brands that should be concerned. I think, unfortunately, due to COVID, there are a lot of brands that probably are not going to be around, even though they it was no, through no fault of their own. This will date this podcast, but GameStop's been in the news all this week with a lot of market forces going on. And the one thing I can't help but think is if you're the head of marketing for GameStop, what do you do? I mean, you are, you're caught in the middle of a hurricane. Right. Um, and, and so there is sometimes, you know, I'm from Louisiana originally, some, in one expression, sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you. So sometimes despite your best efforts, brands are uh, in a tough spot that they can't get out of. But for the most part, if your brand is founded on a real key fundamental insight of a target audience and you're consistently delivering a benefit to that target, you should be able to figure out a way to survive no matter what the outside forces are. Yeah. Tell me about the marketing landscape today versus what it was, say, 20 or 25 years ago. Well, obviously, the biggest change is the whole digital universe has uh, exploded. My marketing career actually goes back 40 years. And at the very beginning, it was really simple. You had three major television networks. Newspapers were still a thriving business. Radio was actually still a big part of the mix. And I think as of uh, this year, Digital has overtaken television, believe it or not, in terms of the absolute amount of money that's spent. Also, media habits have radically changed in terms of more time spent on social media than on television and the ability for a relatively small number of consumers to have a really big impact on how the world views your brand. The biggest change is just coming to grips with the, the fact that the media channels have changed, the media consumption has changed. The amount of control that you have as a marketer has radically changed. And the final thing I think that's changed is I think we're going through a number of megatrends right now as far as uh, social issues go. And some companies are doing a great job embracing those challenges and leading through the change and being proactive. And other companies are just pretending like they don't exist or they hope they go away. 
So I think the, one of the other big outcomes of what we're seeing right now is that those brands that are leaders in terms of champion, you know, what I call the social good are, are going to be much, much better off in the long run than those companies that don't want to engage in that. So you recently co-authored a book with Bob Pearson, another guest of our show called Crafting Persuasion. Why did you and Bob and another author, Ed Tazia. Yeah, Ed, 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 Tazia the, Ed Tazia also was a, one of the co-authors. Yeah. Why did you all write that book? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? I think the biggest problem we were trying to solve is that we were working with the um, State Department on helping the people on the field figure out a way to be more uh, strategic in their messaging. And the specific problem that we uh, heard over and over again is let's say you were in an embassy and the ambassador said, I'd like to get a Facebook posting or I want to send out a Twitter announcement or I want to do a YouTube interview. And they would do it because that was part of the job, but they were frustrated in terms of, you know, I'm not sure I understand why we're doing it or what the long-term goal of this is or who we're even trying to talk to. And we need you guys to come in and try to create some type of a way of thinking about this to frame the conversation so that our upper management, so to speak, quits doing all of these short-term executional exercises and gets more strategic in terms of how we uh, communicate with our target audience. So that was the genesis of it. And, and what we basically did is we took a lot of the learnings that I had from, and Ed had from Procter & Gamble, which I, I think is pretty darn good at, at figuring out strategic communication, along with all the work that Bob had done over the years with various agencies and companies he'd worked with. And all modesty aside, I, I think it's one of the better books out there if you're trying to figure out what's the best way to create a, a viable, a practical, and yet strategic approach to how you do communication. And it doesn't matter if it's a one-on-one -on -one communication or you're talking to millions, the fundamentals are, are always going to be the same. You talk about the origin of the book, starting with a call to come to the White House. Tell us about that call and that meeting. Yeah, that was, at first I thought that was a prank, but it was uh, 2008. The Bush administration was winding down. I was actually winding down my time at eBay and I got a phone call one night and the individual said, I'm from the National Security Council and America's image is really taking a beating and we're inviting a couple of marketers to come to the White House and talk to the National Security Council about what we can do about it. And after I verified it wasn't a prank, I was you know, pretty excited. <laughs> right. As you think any marketer, I was like uh, a marketer, dream come true. Your country needs you, come, come help right. us out. And went to, the, went to DC and, and went to the White House and went to the cabinet room across from the Oval Office and met for, I think we had about an hour meeting with the actual National Security Council. It wasn't wow. the junior assistants or anything. It was the real deal. But at the end of it, I just said, look, this has been a real honor and a privilege and a pleasure. But if you guys are serious about trying to change the way that we communicate with various audiences around the world, we, we have to do a better job training the people on the ground. And at that point, I, I'd done a couple of, not a couple, I did a number of seminars at both PepsiCo and eBay on training people how to think more strategically about marketing communication. So we created what we came to call the United States Marketing Communication College, the USMCC. And for about the next decade, pro bono, we taught at the State Department training facilities, several thousand diplomats of various types on how to think more strategically. And, and that was, again, the basis of the book. In the book, we've captured the model and, and, and how it works and, and a lot of real world case studies as well, both, both from the private sector as well as from government. Tell us a little bit about that model. If you think about any kind of model that's gonna be any good for you, you don't wanna to have to go look it up on your computer or a book or try to remember what was that. It's gotta be simple enough that you can carry it around your head. And I could literally wake you up in the middle of the night and you could you know, just spill it out to me. And so uh, we said, everybody knows their ABCs. So here's the way to think about the model. Five core elements on any communication strategy. A for audience, B for behavioral objective, C for content, D for delivery, and E for evaluation. But that's in essence the model. And anytime you develop a, 
a strategy. And, and one of the things we've done is also created a, a template for folks. So if you go to the website that we've created that goes along with the book, uh, craftingpersuasion.com, you can actually go to the exhibits and uh, you can see an example of a template that's uh, got the definitions and also a blank one. And so you can create your own strategy, which the, the big mantra for the marketing college uh, that we stressed over and over again, and I see it violated on a daily basis, strategy before execution, strategy before execution. So no matter what you're trying to communicate, take the time to really figure out what is your strategy and what are those fundamental questions that you need to answer first. And you can literally go through the A, B, C, D, E, who is your audience? What are you trying to get them to do? What is the content that's going to persuade them to go do that? How are you going to deliver that message? And what's your success criteria to evaluate it? So this is not rocket science. This is not very complicated. And yet I would argue way too many folks uh, don't do it at all. And, and if you want to go back to the example of great brands, I can tell you that great brands absolutely would check every one of those questions off consistently. So if you take nothing away else from this podcast, I hope people remember strategy for execution and perhaps our book can help them figure out how to do that. So a lot of companies and marketers, as you said, focus on just content and delivery uh, of their marketing campaign. What's the price that they would pay if they didn't follow the model as you've outlined it? I think a one word answer would be confusion. Their potential audience doesn't ever even find out about them because they haven't figured out where does that audience consume their media? What does their audience care about? What would be a motivating benefit for that audience? And it also makes it really difficult for the next team that comes along and is in charge of the marketing because there's no thread. The reason I'll mention Geico is another brand I think that's done an outstanding job. And Geico, believe it or not, spends a billion dollars a year for one simple message. Give us 15 minutes, we'll save you 15% more on your car insurance. And yet that must keep working for them because they've come up with, oh, a half dozen creative approaches I could just off the top of my head give you to just reinforce that message over and over again. So they're very consistent creatively. They know who their target is. They know what their behavioral objective is, buy our insurance. And they've got enough content and media vehicles, and they know how to evaluate it. More premiums are collected every year. To answer your question, there's confusion and chaos and ruin if you don't do it. And if you do it well, untold riches and success. You choose, which one do you want? That's a compelling argument. Yeah. <laughs> where, where do marketers or their companies get marketing wrong? What are some of the marketing missteps or marketing campaigns that have really just misfired in the public? I, I don't want to pick on any particular brands because they're for the grace of God go I, but just look <laughs> around. One, one exercise that I've done ever since I started at Procter, and, and this is what my hiring manager told me to do. I was so excited to get started and he said, okay, slow down. I just want you, here's one homework assignment. Every time you watch a television commercial, I want you to evaluate whether or not you think it was an effective ad and to be able to articulate to me why or why not. Hmm. And you know, 100,000 TV commercials later. So I, I actually look forward to most TV commercials because I'm almost using it as a way of sharpening the sword every time and being able to articulate to myself, okay, I'd give that a, a 90 or a 60 or a 20. And here's why. And, and a lot of the mistakes people make is, and you see this, unfortunately, on way too many Super Bowl ads. How many times have you watched a Super Bowl ad? And number one, you have no idea what it's what brand you're talking about. <laughs> number two, you have no idea what benefit they're selling. And number three, you're not quite sure what they want you to do next. Other than that, the agency and the client got to go to the Super Bowl and have a good time. There's no real lasting benefit from what they've done. So look around. You, you don't have to look very far to see examples of really disappointing advertising. And in a, a world in which everything is being measured and what's the ROI and, and how do we cut money, one of the fastest ways of decimating your marketing budget is to be non-strategic, to not really be able to demonstrate any benefit from your marketing. And I guarantee your finance friends will come in and go, thank you very much. We'll take it from here. And before you know it, you're trying to exist on price promotions, which is the ultimate death knell for any brand. Because unless you are a value-based brand, and, and that's your sole reason for being, if you're down to competing only on price, then pack it up and go home. You're done. What are some of your favorite campaigns? 100,000 
TV commercials later. Let's see here. I had a couple that I I was thinking about. I I think if you, and this is dating me a bit, but if you go back 10 years and remember the, hi, I'm a Mac, I'm uh, Windows, those ads uh, talking about the Macintosh computer, those were classics. More currently, and a friend of mine actually did these ads, uh, Farmer's Insurance, we know a thing or two about insurance because we've seen a thing or two about insurance. If you think about it, as opposed to a Geico ad, which is primarily talking about what a great value they are. Farmers never really talk that much about price. They talk about expertise. And obviously that campaign must be working for them because they've run it for a number of years. And I'm sure in their research, in terms of name a brand that knows what they're talking about, they would rank high. Capital One is another one that, even though I find the creative a bit irritating, they've really drilled home the idea of what's in your wallet. And if you think about your own habits, you probably only are going to use one or maybe two credit cards in your personal finance. And I'm sure one of the reasons they continue to do well is that that credit card, Capital One credit card has become the uh, credit card of choice for, for millions of users. So again, my criteria for success is not only does it get your attention, is it focused and memorable? Does it have a meaningful benefit and action, you know, call to action? But what were the business results? And you add all those up. And unfortunately, that's a shorter list than a lot of agencies and brands would, would like to think about. A lot of ad campaigns go nowhere and, and they're just a waste of money. Mm-hmm. I want to do a post-mortem on an ad that went live a few years ago. And it was in 2017. It was actually your one of your former employers, PepsiCo. Mm-hmm. And I want to actually do a little bit of an armchair analysis of a campaign or rather an ad that they put out featuring Kendall Jenner uh, that completely misfired. What do you think Pepsi's intent was in that ad? Because I'm sure that there was a lot that a lot of thought that went into that. And why do you think it it didn't quite hit on all cylinders? Pepsi has historically been known as a, a rebel, a cutting edge brand, a, a little bit of a reverent brand, as opposed to Coke, which is much more traditional. Mm-hmm. And even though I, I know nothing at all about the thinking behind the commercial, I, I think they were trying to embrace some of the social changes and causes that are out there, but they were doing it in a really awkward <laughs> way. If you look at some of the corporate advertising Procter & Gamble is doing in terms of inequality and and making sure people get a fair shake. And that's got a pretty serious message too, because it's a serious problem. Um, If you're in the middle of a riot, the idea of going out there and offering somebody a carbonated beverage and all of a sudden everything's cool, that's almost satire. In fact, when, unfortunately, when the January the 6th riots were going on, part of the news on social media was, is Kendall Jenner is heading to DC now with a case of Pepsi, so it's going to be okay. So yeah, it became a bit of a punching bag for what I'll call really stupid commercials. If I'm not mistaken, I think that was, was that on the Super Bowl when they aired that one? I, and, I, it may have been. Yeah. And, and from memory, I don't think it aired much after that. I think it was one of those that it got such a backlash. And one, one good or bad thing about social media is you don't have to wait around very long to know what people think about something. So True. <laughs> that one became the laughing stock. And I would bet whichever agency did that, it's not on their best of reel. It's, uh, it's it, it was a misfire. But in fairness to Pepsi, they've had a number of really great ads uh, and, and you can't win them all and every now right. and then you crank out. But no, that was just an ill-conceived campaign from start to finish. Yeah. What do you think are some of the misconceptions that people have about marketing? And, and what is the truth that people need to know about how marketing really works? I think the biggest misperception people have about marketing is it forces people to do things that they don't want to do. I think a lot of folks think of marketing the way they think of used car salesmen. They're pushy, they're loud, they're arrogant, they're insensitive. And to me, the mantra that every marketer ought to have is, and this is basically what gets drilled into you at Procter & Gamble, our mission is to listen and respond to the voice of the customer. And if you think about it, if you've got a C-suite of executives and you're sitting around the table, the sacred duty of the marketer is to represent the consumer at that table. And with all due respect to the other functions, nobody else is going to speak up for the consumer. If marketing doesn't listen and respond to the voice of the customer, nobody will. With all due respect to the finance folks, that's not their number one goal. They're, They're not really thinking about that. Neither is operations, neither is IT, neither is legal or HR. 
the only function that is there to represent the consumer is the marketing person. All those functions are really important, but I believe the marketing one is especially important because of the importance of making sure that the person who makes it all possible, that is the ultimate consumer, if they're not strongly represented and that's not top of mind on everything you do on a daily basis, then uh, the, the brand's at risk and the business is at risk. And again, Procter is, again, I'm, I'm such a, continue to be a big fan of that company. Great company. Uh, their their uh, mission is touching consumers' lives every day, which they do. They've got products that I guarantee you've used throughout the day, week, year, your life. And uh, a lot of their success has been because they've just got that consumer front and center on every single thing they do. And it, it trumps anything else in terms of how much money can we make or how much social media presence can we generate or any of that stuff. Just making sure people feel like they've got a, a trusted partner with that brand is top of mind. And, and that's what great marketing is. And that's what great marketers do. What's the biggest piece of advice you would offer up to an up and coming CMO, chief marketing officer and their C-suites? One of the things that I try to do throughout my marketing career, and you can actually do it today a lot easier, is always be testing, ABT. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you were the CMO at Taco Bell, the way I was, at any particular point in time, we had five or six different experiments going on around the country. It might've been a, a new product or a new advertising campaign, maybe a new media test, maybe a new distribution idea, maybe a new strategic partnership test. Because here's the challenge on uh, marketing. You have to make big bets. And if you are forced to make a big bet with having little or no knowledge, you might as well go to Vegas. Whereas right. if you have a, a continual series of experiments going on and you've got very clear criteria and you've got a time frame, you know what the financial implications are, to be able to go to your CEO and your CFO and say, we came, we saw, we conquered, we did this experiment, it really looks solid, the, the results are good, and let's go spend $10 million on it. That it. Those are the things that either make or break a career. So my biggest advice would be always keep your test pipeline full, always be thinking about what can you be learning and try to take those learnings in a real disciplined manner and apply those to scaling. Because again, the really strong marketers I know are, are, are never done. School's never out. That's frankly part of what makes marketing fun. There's always something else you can go learn and, and try and experiment with. And that's how you get innovation and that's how you get breakthroughs. So always be testing. Part of your work is where you actually are an operating partner with a venture capital firm mm -hmm. and you work with a lot of younger companies uh, yes. in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. How would your advice change for them? Those that are closer to the startup phase or, or maybe just early in the phase of their existence. And because I think that for a lot of companies, it's easy for them to come up with a product or a service, but I think they, they might not really understand how to do marketing. What advice would you give to them? Because that's advice that you actually give fairly consistently to your portfolio. I, I would give them the same advice we've talked about earlier. I would say a strategy before execution. So make sure that they've gone through the really hard work of figuring out who's their audience and why, and really know that audience better than anybody else. Really understand the behavioral objective that they're going after, understand the kind of content in terms of benefit, reason to believe, brand persona that would appeal to that audience. What are the right media channels or vehicles to get to that audience with that message and, and how are we going to evaluate it? So let me assume they've done the good work on the strategy. And then the other piece of advice I gave earlier, recall that I said it's even easier to do that today than it used to be. You can do an infinite number of A-B tests on marketing now. And, and, and since digital is the predominant way of doing it, go nuts. I would have a series of experiments going on in terms of messaging and, and even drilling down to the nitty gritty because it's amazing, Mark, sometimes the difference, a different color or image or font or message or... So think of all of the digital marketing as a multi-variable equation, which you're continually trying to optimize in real time. I don't care if that's your Google AdWords or your email campaign or your social media or et cetera, et cetera. 
you can always be going in the lab, doing experiments. We're, we're no different than the R&D department. We just have a much bigger playground to work in. But it's that disciplined approach in terms of we're getting better and better over time, honing our message and making our target audience want to go do what they want to go do based on our understanding of what they've told us. Yeah. One of the things that I'm hearing a lot as you've been responding is, is the critical role of data in, right. in marketing. It's, it, it, that, that's a little bit of a surprise to me, I think, and maybe to a lot of people is how seemingly data intensive marketing really is. I'm on a board of a company that we've invested in called NetBase Quid. I have been on that board for about 12 years. It's amazing the technical advances they've made in terms of being able to take what I call tsunami <laughs> worth of data coming in. And think about data, not only just data from your own company, but just the data from the bigger pool of its oceans worth of data from social media, from competitors, from economic data to government data. And the beautiful thing that companies like NetBase Quid can do is to take all of that data and try to make some sense out of it. Because if you don't have some really powerful platforms and algorithms and, and ways of quickly analyzing that data, and figuring out, okay, one of my favorite mantras of a PepsiCo chairman was, what, so what, now what? And if, if you're thinking about looking at a big ocean worth of data, the, the three thoughts in your mind ought to just be, what, so what, now what? And how can we do that in real time? Because you don't have the luxury, like an academic, of taking a couple of years to study it. You've got, right. you know, in, in some cases, literally a day, a week, maybe a month if you're lucky, but you got to make the call and, and the more you can make it on uh, database judgment is going to be a lot better than what it just felt right. Or my gut said, go do it. Sometimes you have to go with your gut, but I've always been a big fan of gut backed up with data. And that's the ultimate combination. And, and the other thing I'll add there is, and I think this was Steve Jobs, you're never going to get a hundred percent confidence on anything, but if you can get up to about a 70% confidence level, then go for it. Where you tend to make the mistakes is if you're only at 30% and, and you're just going and you'll look back later on and go, wow, if we just taken a little bit more time to, to get the right data or go through the right analysis, we would have come up with a totally different conclusion. So again, it, it, a lot of marketing is yin and yang and, and this data versus gut, you've got to somehow figure out the best way to bring those together to make the best decisions for your brand. Tell us about your next book. So the first book, Crafting Persuasion, was more like a textbook. And, and I say that with uh, all the love in my heart because it, it deals with a very rigorous topic. And uh, in fact, some colleges are now using it for a textbook. So that's cool. That's awesome. But I've been really blessed and lucky in my own career. I, I've had the opportunity to do things that as a kid, I would never even imagined. I've worked in over 60 countries around the world and have done and have had the opportunity to do a number of really interesting things. And what I've done is collected a, a series of stories that have happened to me. And look, I, I don't wanna pretend like I, I deserve, here's my biography because I don't think I'm that interesting, but I do think I've got enough lessons learned that I organized the book based on some values that I've learned and tested and experienced over my life. Things like resilience or integrity or audacity or creativity. And I think it'll be a fun book because it's going to be designed so that I don't feel like you got to read it page one through the end. And you can literally jump around depending upon what you're interested in. Let's say you're wanting to be inspired to be a bit, a bit more creative. Well, you can read the, uh, the chapter on creativity. And at the end of it, and I'm going to give you some examples from my own life on how I've been able to leverage my creativity. And I've got some reflection questions at the end so that you can either reflect to yourself or if you want to reflect with some other people. But the whole idea of this book is, wouldn't it be cool if I could take some of those things that I learned over the years and share with other people and encourage them to take, take that chance? Uh, because the other lesson I've taken away from all of this, and this is an expression I picked up in India, and it's simply leap and the net will appear. And uh, I've read enough biographies of, of famous people to know that the biggest regret that most people have is not what they did, but what they didn't do. And 
What I'm going to encourage people in this book to do is, look, don't go do anything stupid. Don't go out and throw caution to win. But if it's, if it's a bit scary or you're not quite sure how you're going to figure it out, give it a shot, especially when you're younger, because that is what I've done during my whole life, sometimes because I felt like I had to and sometimes because I wanted to. But my goal at the end of my life is to look back and have no regrets, to feel like I gave it a shot and sometimes... It worked out and sometimes I'll learn some valuable lessons, but that's what makes life interesting. And I would hope that would inspire some people to maybe take a risk that otherwise they might not take. It sounds like a compelling book. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'll, you'll be one of the first to get it. So you can tell. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. So I want to do something a little bit different, actually. And I want to do something called speed round. So I'm okay. going to say a word and okay. you tell me the first word that comes to mind. Taco Bell. Innovative. Innovative. First of all, look at their, their product lineup. And I can poke a little bit of fun at Taco Bell. I love Taco Bell. I, I eat Taco Bell on a weekly basis, but it's not really Mexican food. If you go down to Mexico and compare what they serve, what Taco Bell serves. So they've taken, I call it Mexican inspired food, but they've built up such a loyal following among uh, a core group of consumers and all the other good stuff that a great restaurant brand has to have in terms of consistency and quality and just making it a really interesting consumer experience. So yeah, I think they're an innovator. If you compare them to almost any other fast food chain out there, like at one point, I think one of the slogans was, uh, think outside the bun. And I'd say Taco Bell has absolutely done that. So yeah, they're an innovator. Yeah. And a $10 billion brand to boot in annual sales. So. Not too shabby at all. KFC. Global. Believe it or not, KFC is much bigger outside the U.S. than a lot of people realize. It's a monster brand over in China. And I'm really pleased to have been a, a small part of that. When I first started working with a, a guy named Sam Su, who went over from PepsiCo to try to revive the, the brand in China, uh, there were four failing restaurants. If you look fast forward to today, I've lost count. There are literally thousands of restaurants and billions of dollars of the sales in China and a, a very dominant player uh, that is right up there with McDonald's. So that, and I opened up uh, KFC in about a dozen markets on my own. I was general manager throughout the world. Global would be my answer for KFC. Nice. eBay. Renaissance. Jamie I know me is the uh, new CEO at eBay. I was at eBay 20 years ago and we were hot. And at the time, eBay was probably the hottest company around. I, I think that one thing Meg Whitman used to say is the disrupted become the disruptor. And then it, it eventually reverses itself because you know, if you get used to the status quo, other people come along. But I'm excited with some of the stuff Jamie's doing with eBay, and uh, I think they're going to have a bit of a renaissance. And I think Amazon's probably going to be the dominant player in, in the e-commerce space forever. But I, I think eBay is going to find its way and, and do well with its own special uh, secret sauce. Yeah. Procter & Gamble. I'd say of all the companies in the world, they are consumer obsessed. They've been around for almost 200 years. And... Not only do they tell a good story from a marketing point of view, but the reason they can tell a good story is that they have amazing R&D and they really put a lot of thought into every product they make. And I've been really pleased during this pandemic, they've had a bit of a, a renaissance as well in terms of sales and profitability. I, I still think it's one of the greatest companies in the world and, and they have one of the greatest portfolios of brands in the world. So we're really uh, honored to be affiliated with the uh, P&G alumni group. Pepsi. Challenged. And the, re the reason I would say that is I think that they are going to continue to have to figure out how to pivot away from what's historically been their mainstay and carbonated beverages and salted snacks. I think as the um, population ages and as younger folks become more nutritionally concerned, they've tried. They've got like Quaker, a number of those brands and Gatorade and such, but, and they continue to grow. And, and the good thing about Pepsi is they're never going to sit on their laurels and assume that everything's going to be good. They're continually figuring it out. But that's a really good example of a company that has got to figure out how to, how do you retool for changing conditions, changing consumers. And I'm confident they'll do it. They've, they've got a lot of heavy lifting ahead of them, I think. Yeah. HP. I'm going to say trouble. I know they're a significant player and 
Silicon Valley, but if you look at their history over the last decade or so, I think they've had some real internal challenges as far as which direction they want to go. They split up in terms of the actual business. And once upon a time, HP equal printer. In fact, I've, I've got one here in my office and it's a great printer and all that. But again, as far as what the future holds for HP, I, I think they've got some real strategic work to do to try to figure out in the mind of the consumer, what do they want to stand for and, and how do they deliver upon it? Apple. What can I say? Uh, rebel. And I think that the persona of Apple is Steve Jobs. And even though his personal style might not have been uh, suited for everybody, he was uh, relentless in terms of pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable. He was passionate about the quality of his products. And Tim Cook and the rest of the Apple organization, I think, really lived that on a daily basis. And I think I read that their latest quarter was an all-time record. They just continue to go from success to success. And in terms of both the branding and the quality of their products and their R&D, they are the one to beat. They are an amazing company, amazing brand. CDC. Come back. I think they've had a rough 12 months and we won't go into all the reasons for why they've had their ups and downs, but I continue to be impressed by the overall quality and rigor of their scientists. And I, I think their intent has always been to do the right thing for the American public. And hopefully uh, with this new administration, they're going to be able to shine once again and become partners with the World Health Organization. And we got to we, we gotta buddy up with a lot more folks on this because this is a, a threat to the human race. This is not just a threat to Americans. And we need to point the guns outside the fort, not point the guns inside the fort. We're all hoping the CDC has amazing success because the more successful they are, the more we can get back to what we're all calling the before. Uh, I, I like the before. I miss the before. I want to get back to that. Amazon. Ginormous. I, my, my son actually worked at Amazon for about seven years. And one thing you've got to give a lot of credit to Bezos for is he's been extremely consistent in terms of his mission, his very first letter to shareholders. It's day one. And it's always going to be day one. And I, I think by having that kind of attitude, you're never going to be satisfied with the status quo. And I think that the really great companies never get complacent. And if you look at the companies that are not around any longer, they got complacent. I've worked with any number of companies. At, at eBay, we worked with Radio Shack for a while. And I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's even when, even back then you were going, so what's your future game plan here? It's, it's not looking real good. And there's a long list of dead brands. And I, I think that's the ultimate determinant. Did they get up every morning saying it's day one or did they say, Hey, we're fat and happy and we don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Disney. Family. I actually have a photo of Disney in my office here as a bit of inspiration. I think he was very thoughtful about his target audience. It's first and foremost, families. That's everything he ever did was family oriented. And that's true across the board, whether or not it was the movies, the cartoons, the amusement parks, the merchandise. And they try to bring a little bit of joy in everybody's life who's got young kids. I'd say they've been quite successful in doing that. And I've been very impressed with their latest efforts, like Disney Plus, which we subscribe to along with billions of others. And all the really smart acquisitions they've done, like with Marvel and some of the other brands that have become part of that portfolio. They, they are an entertainment powerhouse, but again, they're not sitting on their got the same spirit that Amazon's got. Every day is day one, and they've got to continually figure out what's next. And, and like I said about testing, uh, they're testing all the time as well to make sure that whatever it is they come up with, they've got enough confidence to make not just a million dollar bet, in some cases, billion dollar bets. So I want to take a step back a little bit and just explore a few just general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? I would say Churchill's quote, never give, never give in, never, except when honor indicates that you should, you know, back away. And, and let me explain that a little bit. I've had some serious setbacks in my career. I, I've been fired. I've uh, had disappointments. I've had some financial messes that I've been in the middle of. 
And one of the things I've got, and I, I give my mom a lot of the credit, I'm an incurable optimist. The, the trick is that the Japanese have an expression, fall down six times, get up seven. So it's that willingness to take your, take your licking and keep on ticking, to try to learn from anything that's happened to you, not to take it as a sign of your personal failure, but hey, we, I didn't fail. This particular situation didn't work out but I'm going to take those lessons and move on to the next opportunity. And there are sometimes, and this is the, the one exception, never a given. And sometimes you look at a situation and go, all things considered, that's just not worth it. If you think of a Venn diagram in your head, you, you've got to have an intersection of God-given talent, a market need, and people willing to pay for it. And, and when those th three things intersect, then you typically can be successful. But you've got to be willing to recognize that in certain situations, maybe one of those Venn diagram circles is not there or not big enough, and you maybe need to move on to the next opportunity. So that would be the, the biggest advice I would give to folks. Never give up, keep trying, learn, reapply yourself, and, and be your own cheerleader, not to the point of being an egomaniac, but also never feeling like you've got beat yourself up too much because I have many people either get cynical or burned out or give up. And the people I truly admire are the ones who have that resiliency. We have this new business I've started, CMO Coaching. We have this thing called CMO Bootcamp. And one of the most powerful things we do in CMO Bootcamp is what we call the power of failure. And what we do is we have these incredibly successful marketing leaders get up and talk about the biggest failure of their career and what they learn from it. And Mark, we've had people leave that boot camp going, holy crap, if that guy could be that successful and recover from that kind of failure, then I'm walking out of here with a, a coat of armor. I, I know that I can take, take a few setbacks in my own career and still be okay. So that'd be a really important message to, to spread around. Just keep on pushing, keep on trying, keep on learning. Because at the end of the journey, it's not going to be the destination. It's going to be the journey that counts. And that's what makes it fun. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to share? Any final thoughts that you want to share with us? I think the only final thought I would share with folks is as part of this coaching business I'm starting, I'm, I'm doing a lot of online learning. And one of the courses we have is what they call appreciative inquiry. And one of the things I've learned from that is you can go a lot further with any relationship if you approach that person with a real sense of respect and appreciation for whatever it is they're doing. And one thing my mom taught me, and this has worked almost every time. I've had one or two instances where it didn't work. <laughs> but if there's something you really want to learn about and there's an expert, if you go to somebody like, I, I go to Mark and I say, Mark, I understand you are really good at doing podcasts. And I would be so appreciative if you could just teach me one or two secrets of your success. It's amazing. I've asked that question hundreds of times to very powerful people. And most people are really flattered if you approach it in that way. So mm -hmm. the one, one thing I would leave everybody with is what can you do in terms of appreciative inquiry with the people that you either know or would like to know to, to enhance your own knowledge of the world and maybe make them feel a little bit better in the process. This world needs a lot more appreciation for, for everybody. And if we all do it on a daily basis, I, I think we might be a, a little bit more fun place to live and work. Kip, I, I agree. This has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for the time that you've spent, the advice that you've shared. Where can people find you online and connect with you? I think my uh, platform of choice would be on LinkedIn. It's simply Kip Knight. I, I do regular posts there. And if you want to message me, that'll be fine. Uh, you're also welcome to send me an email, kipknight at gmail.com, and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. Kip, thank you. This has been fantastic. Thank you for everything that you shared. Thank you for your advice. Thank you for your wisdom. And thank you uh, for your time, for the time that you spent with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. It's been fun.